Welcome to the Australian Business Executive Podcast, where we speak with Australia's most influential industry professionals on the business and economic development issues taking place across the country. You can stay up to date with all our content, including our magazines, podcasts and videos by visiting www.theabe.com.au and clicking on subscribe. Today's guest is C plus C Architectural Workshop MD, Clinton Cole. Clinton, how are you today? Great. Thanks, Jesse. So firstly, why don't you take us through the background of C plus C Architectural Workshop? Uh, look, I came from a construction background before I studied architecture. Um, I then, after graduation and during studies, worked for a few conventional architecture firms. Um, what I noticed was that a lot of their work was uh, ending up in the bottom drawer, unbuilt, uh, and it was made mainly due to, I guess, the, the lack of control over the construction phase and also just a lack of kind of cost management being brought to the design process. Um, so, um, yeah, I basically got my builder's licence and decided to do what very few other people have ever done and try and do both services under the one roof. Fair enough. So what is the scope of services uh, under C plus C? Uh, look, it's really from concept design all the way through to uh, the construction phase. We, we, we kind of focus exclusively on um, like forever homes, uh, single residential houses. Um, we're um, exclusively focused on, I guess, people who are committed to the long-term uh, outcome and to their, to, to kind of multi-generation, I guess, a multi-generation home that they'll um, uh, grow up with their kids, um, they'll move on, their kids live there, and hopefully um, generation to generation. Um, so that's a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all right. I think when, when we originally talked about this, uh, I remember you sort of explained to me that that these are, as you said, multi-general homes that, that, that when they're buying into them or working with you, they expect their children and their children's children to, to potentially live in them as well. That's correct. And, and, and in, when you have a brief like that, um, sustainability becomes um, kind of, they work hand in hand because the client's looking well beyond their lifetime. Um, they're looking to you know, what, their, what their home can do and serve in terms of the needs of their children from uh, things like having chicken coops and uh, productive gardens, um, of course, the usual solar and water, uh, grey water systems. We're, we're now moving into um, projects where we're, uh, we've got natural pools where the, the, the pool actually has kind of fish and frogs in it. Uh, and it's filtered naturally through um, through reed beds. Um, so yeah, next level sustainability, which is you know it's a pleasure to be working in in that particular field. Mm. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned environmentalism. Is this uh, like today in today's environment? We know that this is fairly commonplace. But has this always been part of you know your design remit? If we talk, you know, going back a decade or so ago, it's always been part of uh, of mine. Yeah, right from the. Because the very first projects I worked on or had the opportunity to design and build were in semi-remote areas. So things like solar and water, uh, water capture and grey water systems were... Um, necessity they, almost. They were necessity. They, were, they weren't an option. Uh, you're also on very, very tight budgets looking at uh, maximising any kind of materials available in and around the site that can be um, used or recycled from cutting down local trees to... Uh, to recycling um, bridges that are being pulled pulled down. That, that was kind of my first projects. And I fell in love with that that whole notion that almost uh, uh, you, know, you can source locally, you can build using local materials, and you can uh, uh, almost be off the grid. Um, and that that's transferred into our, our more city-based projects. Uh, and it's, um, you know, 20 years we've been doing this now. It, it, it has become a lot more commonplace, which is uh, fortunate, but... I guess on the architectural side of things, what we as an industry have been promoting for many decades is really the opposite of that. Um, in our view, we're kind of promoting the wrong things to the broader public. So we really like to use our projects as, I guess, uh, a symbol of what can be achieved for the broader public, not just our clients. Uh, and because we understand that our projects are going to be photographed, they're, they're going to be in awards, um, they're going to be in magazines. So. You know, making an impact on on those who might not use an architect in their lifetime is really um, what, what we're all about as well. Yeah, right. A bit of an in inspiration as well. From it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone puts a veggie garden in their backyard because they see a photo of one of our projects or decide to get a couple of chickens. I think we're doing our job well. 
Very good. Let's talk about some of those projects. You know, you can open up and talk about them. I think a lot of people would also want to know, like, what sort of you know budget and what's involved in these as well. Yeah, budget's always um, the, one of the first questions that, that's discussed when we get an inquiry. Uh, look, there's no doubt that one-off custom um, bespoke homes are, are far more expensive than those that are kind of mass produced. I guess the, the project home market has uh, about a 95 percent of share share of the industry. Um, so uh, budget will depend, I guess, on the scope of work, whether you're knocking down and rebuilding, whether you're uh, what the state of the existing building. Building, uh, if you are retaining it, plays a, a big role in determining the budget. Some uh, some existing buildings uh, don't need a lot of work; others need um, uh, a substantial amount of work to retain them. And often in inner city councils, your 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 hands being forced to retain them because of conservation rules. Take me through some of the the projects that you're. Uh most recognized for? Uh, I think we did a house. One of the first projects I did was in St Albans. It's called House in the Bush, and that's going back 22 years now. That's still kind of current in terms of, I guess, it's, I guess the, the outcome and the, the, the images of, of that project, are st- it's still generating work for us now. Um, and that has really led to some larger, uh, I guess, kind of next level sustainable and regenerative projects such as the Welcome to the Jungle House and a, a house we currently have in a, under construction called the Holocene House. Um, the Holocene House has um, uh, has a natural pool, has 64 solar panels. It can basically power the, the local suburb, uh, but that, that client's making these decisions, is making those decisions um, in the interest of uh, its impact on the local community and, and the broader public understanding as we do but when it is photographed um the right things are being noticed about the project not just the design not just the aesthetic uh, but what the what the client has included in their in their brief is an important part of i guess their, their day-to-day family life uh, they have chickens they've got gray water recycling productive gardens um, you name it they've got recycled doors and windows um so we're, we're fortunate to be in a position where having i guess focused on this type of work for for several decades we're getting um clients who are very much aligned with what we believe is uh i guess an an appropriate um way to to spend your budget uh and and to i guess consider future generations not just yourselves um unlike i guess the majority of architecture clients we spoke a little bit about environmentalism you spoke about your own background so where do you see your difference compared to other bespoke architecture firms who might work in this space? Uh, I mean, doing both the architecture and construction, your you know, 80% of our revenue is generated from construction and, and every invoice and every timesheet um, passes either my desk or our project manager's desk. So when you're when those same people and myself are on the drawing board, we're very cognizant of the impacts of our, our design decisions. And I, I started this company to, to have pretty much unfettered control over quality, cost, time, and scope. And they're the things that we manage during the design process, uh, uh, and they're the things that we're able to deliver as promised during the construction process. But it's really important in terms of that design process to keep the client's feet firmly on the ground about budget and time. Uh, It's often where, I guess, conventional architects, um, uh, let's put it this way, it's generally not the industry's strong point. Right, okay. So there's there's a lot more almost individual management of their expectations while you go through this process then. managing expectations is everything if you don't manage it well you'll never the, the project will never see the light of the light of the day um, as uh, many of the conventional architects i originally worked for didn't see the light of day and, and if we're going to put it um as i say to our clients you know we're putting all this energy and all this time uh, and spending all this money uh, during the design process we want to make sure it leads to a built outcome there's nothing uh, nothing anyone should be proud of in terms of an unbuilt outcome mm. um, the industry now uh, has um, has unbuilt design awards, which I find um, kind of ironic. <laughs> Very well. So, what are the um, you know you mentioned about twenty years? What what are the longer term plans moving forward for C plus C? So initially, uh, I was doing both the construction and the the architecture myself, and I'd bring in the occasional contractor. I'm now at a point where I'm not working on site. I've got um, construct three construction teams running our construction projects. And I'm at the time, uh, at, at this time in my life, I'm looking at, I guess, uh, working out how I can bring, uh, you know, upskill staff and um, empower staff to kind of 
take over projects and, and you know probably over the next five to ten years I'm um, backing out of the business myself so letting the next generation of um of people on our team um do what do what I'm doing now excellent when we're doing these entries we're effectively giving you a platform to promote your business and, and talk about other things is there anything happening at an at an industry level that, that's kind of worth noting or, or mentioning there's always things happening, um, whether we like them or not, uh, is probably a, a, um, a, a question that take, would take a lot longer to answer. Uh, we we tend to be a bit, a bit of an outlier to to the industry because we build uh, as well as design. Um, there's, there's only a handful of us, a uh, handful of companies in the country who actually um, do both services as we, we do. So we tend to kind of look at the industry from, from a, probably more more of an objective matter in more of an objective way but one thing that hasn't changed over the last 20 years is the fact that uh, the the gap between um the relationship um between architects conventional architects and conventional conventional builders it, it's it's getting further and further apart where skills are being siloed and I, in my view um you know the tripartite relationship with client architect and separate builder uh it's 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 no longer working uh, and i think the industry really needs to pivot and start looking to companies like ours to look for a pathway forward and you know what uh, teaming up with a builder uh, or a builder teaming up with an architect uh, is going to give the client at the end of the day um more certainty uh, and more um responsibility for the project that they're delivering mm. It can it can tend to fall into to a bit of a, a blame game where there's three parties involved. I remember hearing that one time is a, the architect will give you a design and the builder says this is this won't work at all. You need to change this and then the and then it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. I, I've certainly heard that from the industry before. All right. So before we uh, finish up today, is there anything else that you haven't had a chance to you know make make mention of? Oh, probably one little initiative that we've we've just um, just announced is we're uh, making a hundred thousand dollar contribution to uh, New South Wales University to support um, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, students um, to allow them, I guess, the opportunities that a lot of the team uh, and I um, didn't have when we went through university. Uh, it's a, it's a, an industry that is fairly dominated by quite privileged background students. Um, so uh, our initiative is now supporting a couple of students from New South Wales Uni uh, and including paid employment with uh, with us. So we're really excited about that, uh, that we can, um, we're in, the op- in a position where we can offer that support to a couple of students. All right, Clinton. Well, thank you very much for your time today and, and all the best until we speak again. Right. Thanks a lot, Jesse. This has been a production of the Australian Business Executive, a division of Romulus Rising Proprietary Limited, all rights reserved. You can stay up to date with the Australian Business Executive, including our magazines, podcasts and videos by visiting www.theabe.com.au and clicking on subscribe.